Section 49 of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Pivert de Senancourt, translated by Arthur Edward Waite, 1857-1942. Letter 76. July 2nd. Hans has shown himself a wise man, and is remaining with me. At some six leagues from here, there is a brother of his who is a well-borer, and having a number of pipes to lay, I have got him to come over, and with him also I am well satisfied. He is a discreet and honest man, simple and yet gifted, with that quality of confidence which comes from natural abilities and the consciousness of inflexible probity. Though not particularly robust, he is good at his trade and goes to work well and carefully. He is neither nervous nor officious in my presence, not cringing and not familiar. Moreover, I made personal inquiry in his village to ascertain what was thought of him there, and I even saw his wife. On my return I directed him to sink a well at a point where at first he could scarcely see how it would be of use to me, and subsequently, while he was completing some other labours, they erected a small peasant's cottage close by it, after the style of the country, containing several rooms on a single floor, together with kitchen, barn, and stable the whole being accommodation enough for a small household, including winter quarters for two cows. Behold himself and his wife installed therein, with the requisite plot of ground and some few things besides. It is true that the conduit pipes may be wanting for the moment, but my well-sinker will not be wanting. His domicile was prepared in the space of twenty days, for it is one of the advantages of this kind of erection that, given the proper materials, ten men can put it up in a couple of weeks, and there is no need to delay till the plaster dries. On the twentieth day, as I have said, it was all ready. The evening was fine, and I gave orders for him to strike work a little earlier than usual. I led him up to the cottage and said to him, this house, with its store of wood, which you can renew annually from my own, these two cows, and the meadow as far as that hedge, are set apart henceforth to your use, and will continue so as long as you are well conducted, which it is almost impossible for me to doubt that you will be. Let me now mention two facts by which you may conclude for yourself whether this man deserves all that I have done for him and even more. Feeling, apparently, that the extent of his service should answer adequately for that of the gratitude of an honest heart, he insisted only on the remarkable similarity between all he saw and all that he had ever imagined as the sum of his whole ambition, that which, without any hope of obtaining, he had pictured, ever since his marriage, as the supreme good, that which alone he would have asked of heaven could he have formulated a petition which deserved to be heard thereby. This will please you, but here is something which will surprise. He has been married for the past eight years, and the couple have been without children. Misery has been their sole patrimony, for, burdened with a debt bequeathed to him by his father, the labor of his hands has barely secured the necessities of existence for himself and his wife. The latter is now with child, Consider the new facilities, or even chances, which a condition of habitual penury offers for the development of our faculties, and judge if one could find, among sentiments devoid of ostentation, within and without, more of native nobility or of justice. I count myself exceedingly fortunate that I possess what I do without owing it to a condition by which I should be obliged to live like a rich man and to waste in frivolities what is capable of bearing so much fruit. I acknowledge, with the moralists, that large possessions are frequently an illusory advantage, 
and of a kind which too often we render fatal but i shall never allow them that an independent fortune is not one of the chief means of happiness and even of wisdom letter seventy seven july sixth in this diversified country where the incidents of nature restricted within a narrow area are in conflict with forms products and climates even the human species is denied an, an uniform character racial differences are more marked here than elsewhere in these faraway places so long regarded as inaccessible in these deep valleys the antique refuge of fugitive or perishing hordes the confusion and admixture of types has obtained in a less degree alien to one another the tribes there have remained isolated within their wild confines they have preserved as many special peculiarities in administration language and manners as their mountains have valleys or perhaps even pastures and hamlets it may happen that crossing a torrent six times in the course of an hour's journey as many races will be met with having each a distinct physiognomy and traditions which substantiate the diversity of their origin the existing cantons are made up of a multitude of states the weaker among them are joined by fear by treaty by necessity even by force to the already powerful republics and the latter by much astuteness by growth by cajolery invasion or conquest became after five centuries of prosperity possessors of all the district within sound of the bells of their capitals reputable weakness had they only known had they only been able to discover therein the means of that public happiness which seems so attainable in a region which is enclosed naturally so impossible in an extensive country governed by the fatal pride of conquest and the ostentation of empire more fatal still you will be perfectly well aware that my intention was to speak simply of physiognomical characteristics you will i am sure do me this justice in certain portions of the oberland in those pastures which for the most part slope to the east and the northeast there is a whiteness of skin among the women which would be noticeable even in towns and at the same time a freshness of complexion which it would be rare to find in these furthermore at the foot of the mountains no great distance from freiburg i have met with liniments of great beauty the general character which has been a majestic repose for example the female servant of a farmer had only one noticeable point the outline of her cheek but it was so lovely and it imparted to the whole of her face an expression so august and so calm that an artist might have taken her head as an ideal model for semiramis however beauty of countenance and a few wonderful or superb characteristics are quite apart from general perfection from that grace instinct with harmony which constitutes true beauty i have no wish to rule dogmatically over points which may be thought very delicate but here as it seems to me there is a certain rudeness of form and speaking generally striking characteristics or beauty of the picturesque order are found rather than finished beauty in the places which i mentioned at the outset the upper part of the cheek is markedly prominent indeed there is almost universal and porta would refer to it the head of the genus picus as to a common prototype now if it should happen that a french peasant girl were very pretty at the age of eighteen before two and twenty her tanned face would have become tired and spiritless in these mountains on the contrary the women are preserved by their haymaking in all the brilliance of youth it is impossible to travel through their country without experiencing a surprise and yet taking only the face if an artist made it his model it would be only by way of an exception it is affirmed that there is nothing so rare as a fine bust in the greater part of switzerland i know a painter who goes so far as to say that in this respect 
The general deficiency is so universal that most of the women cannot imagine things otherwise, and consider that pictures from nature in Greece, England, and France are merely monstrous fictions. Although this species of perfection seems to belong to a type of beauty which is foreign to this country, I cannot believe that it is universally wanting, as if the most interesting graces were excluded by the modern name of the country which unites so many families who have no community of origin and whose marked differences are still persistent. On the other hand, should the statement prove well-founded, and should it be also true that there is a certain irregularity in the form, these facts might be explained by the asperity which seems inseparable from the alpine atmosphere. It is indubitably true that Switzerland, though it can boast fine men, more especially in the vicinity of the mountains, as, for example, in Hall and the Hot Valais, contains notwithstanding an abnormal proportion of idiots, and above all, of those half-idiots, creatures with glandular affections, imbeciles, and deformed people. Many of the inhabitants, without actually being afflicted by goiter, seem subject to kindred maladies. Such swellings and enlargements may be attributed to the coarser constituents of the water, and of the air more than all, which stop and clog the ducts, and would seem to approximate the nutriment of man to that of the vegetable. Is it possible that the land is cultivated sufficiently for other animals, but is still too savage for humanity? Or may it not also be that the plains, covered with an artificial soil by an incessant trituration, impart vapors to the atmosphere which are more adapted to the requirements of the organized being, while from rocks, quagmires, and waters that are always in darkness, there is an emanation of grosser particles, too uncultivated, so to speak, and hurtful to delicate organs. Possibly the nitre in the snow, which subsists even in midsummer, finds entrance too easily into our open pores. Snow has secret but incontestable effects on the nerves, and on men subject to gout and rheumatism, so that an effect still more concealed upon our whole organization is not out of the question. Thus nature, which qualifies all things, would compensate by unknown dangers for the romantic loveliness of the regions which are unsubdued by man. End of section 49、section、fifty of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by A. T. N. Piver de Senancour, translated by Arthur Edward Waite, 1857 to 1942. Ninth year, letters 78 and 79. Letter seventy eight, Immenstrom, July sixteen nine. I am fully in agreement with you, and should be content with even slighter occasion to decide me to write. There is something sustaining to the soul in this commerce with thinking beings of various ages, to imagine one's self at the side of Pythagoras, Plutarch, or Ossian, or in the study of a future L. Is an illusion which has a side of grandeur and is indeed one of man's noblest hobbies. Whoever has seen the scalding tear on the cheek of the unfortunate falls to dreams of a still more alluring kind. He pictures himself imparting to the man of mournful disposition the price of the joy of his kind, forestalling the moans of the forgotten victim, restoring some strength to the desolated heart. By recalling to it those perceptions, vast or consoling, which mislead some or sustain others, some consider that our evils have only a slender ground, and that moral good is within easy reach of man. The notion of universal happiness is inferred from theoretical consequences. Overlooking that force which maintains us in the state of confusion wherein the human race is lost, 
it is customary to proclaim our determination to oppose errors follow natural principles and express only what is good or may become good such intentions seem to render us less useless and abandoned on earth we combine the dream of great things with the peace of an obscure life and truly enjoy the ideal because we think that we can turn it to account the order of things ideal is like a new world possible but not realized human genius has recourse to it when seeking to conceive of a harmony in accordance with our wants and brings back to earth more favourable modifications modelled on this supernatural type the constant versatility of man demonstrates that he is quickly adaptable to fresh habits by the combination of things which have been actualized in a variety of times and places it would be possible to form a whole less unsuited to his heart than all that has been so far proposed to him such is my task the close of day is reached without weariness only by some self-imposed labour even if otherwise vain i will approach the evening of my life if possible deluded and sustained by the hope of increasing those resources which have been vouchsafed to man illusions are necessary to my heart too great not to long for them and too weak to dispense with them since the experience of happiness is our first requirement what shall he do who neither looks for it in the present nor dares to expect it in the future must he not seek its expression in a friendly eye on the countenance of the being who is like himself he can do no otherwise than long for the joy of his kind he has no other happiness but that which he imparts when he has never wakened the sensation of life in another has caused no rejoicing the cold of death is at the bottom of his rejected heart he seems to finish in the darkness of the void we hear of men who are sufficient to themselves and find nourishment in their own wisdom if they have eternity before them i admire and envy them if otherwise i fail to understand them for myself i not only fall far short of happiness as things now are not only shall i never attain it but if the reasonable suppositions which i might make should come to be realized i should fail of it all the same the affections of man are an abyss of greed repentance and errors i do not tell you what i feel what i wish what i am i no longer distinguish my necessities i scarcely know my desires if you believe that you are acquainted with my tastes you will be deceived therein you say amidst your solitary lands and your mighty waters where is he who no longer possesses me where is the friend whom i have found neither at africa nor at the antilles here is the clouded time which would soothe his sadness he goes forth wandering he broods over my regrets and the void of his own years he listens with his face to the west as if the notes of my daughter's harp could reach his lonely ear he sees the jasmine which covers my terrace my grey hat moving behind the trees the print of my shoes on the sand he longs for the cool evening air vain dreams i cry to you i shall have already changed and again does the same sky brood over us who have found in such different climates a land which is alien to that of our early days in the midst of your balmy evenings a winter wind may here terminate the scorching days the sun has burnt up the grass in the vicinity of the cowsheds on the morrow the cows press eagerly forth expecting to find it freshened by the dew of the night but two feet of snow cover the roofs above them and they must perforce drink their own milk for myself i am more uncertain and variable than this outlandish climate that which to-day i like or at least do not find displeasing may be repugnant by the time that you have read about it yet it will not be a great change i find the weather charming it is calm it is quiet 
and i go out of doors meaning to remain abroad a long time but in a quarter of an hour i am back again a squirrel upon hearing me has clambered to the top of a fir-tree i put aside all these notions a blackbird is singing over my head i retrace my steps and shut myself up in my study after all i must find a book which will not weary me if some one comes in to ask me a question or to take an order he apologizes for disturbing me but i have really been rendered a service this burden goes as it came if i can secure distraction i am content but to find it for myself i am unable i cling to my suffering and am in love with it so long as it lasts when it is over i experience an extravagant rapture you will say that i have indeed changed once i was impatient of life once i put up with it as an evil which would last but for a few months this state of feeling now seems foreign to myself it would be even a source of astonishment if i were capable of astonishment at the rapid changes of my sensations i see no reason for leaving and about as little for remaining i am tired but amidst my fatigue i recognize that it is not unpleasant to be in repose life at once wearies and amuses me to appear on this scene to grow up to make a noise in the world to be harassed over a thousand things to calculate the orbit of comets and then after some days to sleep beneath the turf of a graveyard that seems to me rather fantastic to follow to the end but why pretend that it is the ingrained habit of weariness or the misfortune of a saturnine disposition which disturbs and confuses our desires and perceptions which alloys our life itself with this consciousness of the lapse and vacuity of the days of man there is no need for a melancholic humour to determine the hues of life ask not the son of the incas chained in those mines whence the gold was taken once for the palace of his ancestors and the temple of the sun ask not the diligent and irreproachable labourer begging in his infirm and despised old age ask not innumerable unfortunates the value of human hopes and human prosperities ask not heraclites to calculate the importance of our plans or hegesius the worth of life voltaire loaded with success feasted in courts and admired in europe voltaire illustrious masterly intellectual generous seneca upheld by wisdom amused by honours wealthy to the extent of thirty millions seneca in the shadow of the throne of the caesars and within an ace of himself ascending it seneca of use to men and voltaire making sport of their delusions these will tell you of the soul's delights of the heart and its rest of the value and the permanence of the progress of our days my friend i have yet some hours on earth we are poor maniacs while we live but we are non-entities when we live no more and then there are always schemes left for completion i have a splendid one now in my head to measure the volume of water which falls here in the course of ten years as to the thermometer i have abandoned it it involves getting up in the middle of the night and when the night is dark it necessitates a light at hand which it will be necessary to place in a cupboard because darkness is essential to me in my bedroom one of the few important matters in which i have not yet altered if i am to take interest in the temperature here i must give up neglecting what takes place elsewhere i must arrange for observations in the deserts of senegal and on the top of the labrador mountains another matter interests me more keenly to ascertain whether there have been further explorations of central africa those vast unknown countries where it might be possible as i think but i am apart from the world if it is becoming better known tell me but i am not sure whether you appreciate my meaning letter seventy nine july seventeen nine if i told you that a presentiment of celebrity to come would not be to me any source of satisfaction you would scarcely believe me out of hand you would think that i deceived myself and you would be right 
it is very rarely that the need of self-respect is found wholly detached from the pleasure no less natural which is taken in the estimation of some others and in the knowledge that we are counted among them but the thirst for peace and a certain indolence of soul which has increased with my disillusion might well lead me to forget this particular fascination as i have forgotten others i require to be at once restrained and stimulated by the fear of that self-reproach which would be unavoidable if ameliorating nothing making sluggish use of things as they are i were guilty of neglecting also the sole means of activity which accords with the obscurity of my life must not man prove himself something and in one or another sense play an energetic part if otherwise he will lapse into despondency and abdicate the dignity of his being he will misread his gifts or if conscious of them it will be only for the torment of his hard-pressed soul he will not be heard followed or considered the small modicum of good which should result even from the life of greatest nullity will be no longer in his power simplicity is a very beautiful and useful precept but it has been woefully misconstrued the mind which does not perceive the manifold phases of things will pervert the best maxims and degrade wisdom itself by depriving it of means reducing it to penury and dishonouring it by the disorder which then results assuredly a man of letters in dingy linen housed in a garret patching his garments and copying anything for a living can with difficulty be of use in the world or have the authority which is required for doing good at fifty years old he marries the laundress whose room is on the same floor or supposing him to have saved anything he marries his servant has he sought to render morality ridiculous and subject it to the sarcasms of triflers he does more outrage to opinion than the priest who is subsidized to call the world daily to a worship which he has betrayed than the factious monk who boasts about peace and abnegation or the charlatans of probity of which a section of society is full whose every phrase is larded with manners virtues honesty and to whom notwithstanding no one would lend a shilling without security every man who is possessed of a just mind and has a desire to be useful though only in his private capacity every one in a word who is worthy of any consideration seeks for recognition he shapes his course that he may ensure it even in those things over which human opinion is of itself vain provided that this care involves nothing opposed to his duties or to the essential results of his character if there is a rule with no exception this ought i think to be the one i affirm freely that it is invariably through some vice either of heart or judgment that public opinion is disdained or a disdain for the same is affected wherever justice does not itself demand the sacrifice it is possible to obtain consideration even in the most obscure station given an ordered house and a certain dignity in the mode of life it can be possessed even amidst poverty when a name has been earned when people know what we have done when the manner is greater than the fortune when a distinction is established between that which would be misery in the vulgar and the deprivation of an extreme mediocrity the man of high character is in no case confused with the crowd and if in order to avoid the possibility he must stoop to minute precautions i conceive that he will bring himself to do so nor can i think that it will be the prompting of vanity the perception of what is naturally congruous induces each man to take his proper place or to ensure that he is set there by others if it were a vain desire to excel the superior man would dread the obscurity of the desert and its privations as he dreads the lowness and wretchedness of the social dregs but he fears to degrade himself not to miss elevation to fill an unimportant part is not repugnant to his nature but from one that is opposed to his nature he indeed rebels if a species of authority is necessary for all the actions of life 
it is indispensable to the writing man public consideration is one of his strongest levers without it he follows only a trade and this trade becomes mean because it is substituted for a great function it is absurd and revolting that an author should dare speak to man of his duties without being himself upright but if the ill-conducted moralist earns only contempt he that is unknown remains so wholly useless that his writings at least are ridiculous if he escapes from being so himself all that should be holy among men lost force when books of philosophy religion and morality were exposed amidst the mire of the keys and the solemn pages were given over to the vilest usages of commerce were fame and the public verdict of themselves vain they should not be despised or neglected since they are a great means for the attainment of the most praiseworthy and important ends it is equally disproportionate to do nothing in view of them or all things on their account great purposes accomplished are beautiful by the fact of their grandeur and without it being necessary to dwell on their production and improvement but it is not the same with those that are merely planned the courage of a person who perishes at the bottom of the sea is a lost example and it is the same with the truest thought and the wisest conception if these are not communicated their utility depends on their expression it is their celebrity which causes them to be fruitful it might perhaps be desirable for philosophical writings to be always preceded by a good book of an entertaining character to be circulated read and enjoyed widely the man with a name has greater confidence in speaking he does more and better because he anticipates that his labour is not without its result unfortunately the courage or the opportunities to take such precautions are not always forthcoming writings like other things are the sport of chance occasionally of an unexpected kind they are ruled by influences often foreign to our projects to write a book simply with a view to a name is a task which is to some extent repulsive and servile though i admit that there are reasons which would appear to impose it upon me i dare not undertake and should certainly abandon it at the same time i have no wish to make a start with the work which i am projecting it is too important and too difficult for me ever to accomplish it perfectly it will be much if i find it some day approaching the ideal which i have conceived this remote prospect is however insufficient to sustain me yet it is advisable for me i think to turn author speedily that i may have the courage to continue being one i shall be making a declared stand and in such a way that i must follow it to fulfil my destiny end of section fifty section fifty one of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two ninth year letters eighty and eighty one letter eighty august two nine i feel in agreement with you that a romance is wanted one of those real romances of which we have a few examples the task however is great and would occupy me for a long time from many points of view i should not be fitted to undertake it and for the plot i should have to depend on inspiration meanwhile i think that i will write my travels my design is that those who read them shall follow me through the habitable world when we have taken stock of it together and have acquired something of a common point of view we will retrace our steps and discuss it so do two elderly friends take a turn in the country look about and muse without much conversation merely pointing out objects with their canes but in the evening with the fire in front of them they chat about all that they have seen in their walk 
the pageant of life is full of great beauties and we must suppose ourselves here merely for purposes of observation we must be interested without illusion or passion but also without indifference as one becomes engrossed in the vicissitudes emotions and perils of a fictitious narrative written in an attractive style the way of the world is a drama coherent enough to engage our attention varied enough to enlist interest fixed and regulated sufficiently to satisfy the reason to amuse us with its systems and yet with enough of uncertainty to stimulate our desires and nourish our passions if we were impassable during life the idea of death would be unbearable but we are alienated by suffering and repelled by disgust much impotence and many anxieties make us forget to observe and we withdraw coldly even as we depart from a theatre when a tiresome neighbour the excessive heat or the vitiated air have substituted weariness for eagerness and impatience for curiosity what style shall i select none i shall write as i speak without thinking about it if it were necessary to do otherwise i should not write at all there is this difference however that a verbal utterance cannot be corrected while it is possible to cancel in revising what may be likely to displease the reader the poets and sophists of a less advanced period read their books aloud in assemblies when the delivery had to be adapted to the style and the latter to the way in which it would be read the art of reading is much like that of writing the elegances and accuracies of expression in reading are as infinite as the shades of thought i can scarcely imagine a bad reader with a graceful manner in writing or a just and comprehensive mind genius in sentiment and incapability of expression seem no less incompatible than the power to express forcibly that which we do not feel whatever side may be taken on the question whether all has been said or not from the ethical standpoint it cannot be maintained that nothing remains to be done in this the sole science of man it is insufficient for a thing to be uttered it must be made public demonstrated impressed on all and generally acknowledged nothing has been accomplished until the express law has been subjected to the moral law till public opinion has perceived the things in question under their true relationships disorder must be combated so long as disorder exists do we not daily come across things which are rather the errors of the mind than the outcome of the passions in which there is more of blunder than perversity which are not so much the crime of an individual as an almost inevitable effect of public negligence or absurdity are we no longer justified in asking those of independent fortune by what fatality they subsist in greater real want and anxiety than those who daily toil in their service and in saying to unfaithful children whose eyes are not opened to the degradation of their infidelity you are veritable robbers and of a class which the law should punish more severely than those who despoil a stranger to open theft you add the most hateful perfidy the dishonest servant is punished with more severity than a stranger because he abuses a confidence and security must be ensured at least in one's home are not these considerations which obtain for any one in a fiduciary position much stronger for the son of the house who can deceive with more impunity who is wanting towards more sacred duties from whom is it so painful to withdraw confidence if considerations are interposed to arrest the law there is the greater need of educating opinion rather than abandoning it as is too often the case of fixing its variations and above all making it adequately respected so that it may fulfil what our vacillating laws do not dare to undertake is it necessary no longer to say to women who are full of sensibility pure intentions youth and frankness why yield such inestimable advantages to the first pretender 
do you not observe in his very letters amidst the fantastic jargon of his crass sentiments expressions one of which alone is sufficient to disclose the slender estimation in which he holds you and the degradation in which he feels himself he amuses you but he also deceives and makes sport of you he is preparing your shame and abandonment you would feel it and know it but through weakness or possibly through indolence you risk the honour of your life it may even happen that for the diversion of a night you will corrupt your whole existence the law cannot touch him he will have the sorry licence of laughing at you how have you mistaken this wretched creature for a man would it not have been better to wait and to be still waiting what a distance there is between man and man amiable women do you not realise your worth speak not of the need of love that does not excuse you the paramount need is not to debase yourself and the necessities of the heart should of themselves render you indifferent to one who has no quality of man except that of not being a woman do not find an excuse in the age if our moral institutions are in their childhood if we have confused everything if our reason be groping in the dark your imprudence if less unpardonable is not for that exonerated so long as our soul is pure woman's name is powerful and seemingly the name of man can also impose somewhat upon young hearts but whatsoever the sweetness in which these illusions hide be not too much overcome by them if man is the natural friend of woman it is true also that women have often no greater enemy all men have the promptings of their sex but wait for him who has its soul what can there be in common between you and the creature who is endowed only with appetites has it not frequently happened that we have been drawn by the feeling of happiness into the abyss of misery that our nature has been vitiated by our most legitimate desires and that we have become greedily intoxicated with bitterness we have all the frankness of youth all the longings of inexperience all the needs of a new life and the hope of a sincere heart we have all the faculties of love and we are impelled to love we have all the means of delight and we must ourselves be loved we are entering upon existence what can we do therewith in the absence of love we have beauty freshness grace suppleness nobility charm of manner why this harmony of the movements this voluptuous modesty this voice formed for all expression this smile for alluring all this glance made for the melting of the heart of man why this delicacy of heart and this profound sensibility age desire expedience soul sensibility all demand it it is indeed a necessity everything expresses everything exacts love this skin so soft and of a whiteness so delicately tinted this hand shaped for the tenderest caresses this eye of depths unknown till it speaks and says i consent to be loved this breast which apart from love is motionless mute useless and would at length wither without being rendered divine these lineaments these outlines which would change without having been known admired possessed these sentiments so tender so voluptuous and grand the ambition of the heart the heroism of passion that delicious law prescribed by the law of the world must assuredly be fulfilled that intoxicating part which is known so well which is recalled by every one which day inspires and night commands what young sensible and loving woman will dream of refusing to fill it cease therefore from imagining that just noble and pure hearts are other than the first to be undone more susceptible of exaltation they cannot fail to be led away by that which love can give they are nourished on deceptions believing that they are nourished on esteem they discover that they are in love with a man because they are in love with virtue they are betrayed by scoundrels because unable to love truly any one but a noble man they feel assured that he who offers to realize their chimera is of necessity such energy of soul esteem confidence the necessity of displaying it 
the necessity of having it sacrifices to reward fidelity to crown hope to sustain and advance to follow the agitation the unbearable disquiet of the heart and the senses the laudable anxiety to attempt the return of so much love the anxiety no less just of riveting consecrating perpetuating immortalizing chains so dear yet other desires some fear some curiosity chances which point to it destiny which wills it all these combine to deliver a loving woman into the arms of loveless she loves he amuses himself she yields herself he amuses himself she enjoys he amuses himself she dreams of perpetuity happiness the long enchantment of mutual affection she is in celestial vision she beholds that eye kindled with pleasure she would confer a still greater felicity but the monster amuses himself the arms of pleasure force her into the abyss she devours a terrible delight on the morrow she is surprised restless dreamy sombre presentiments preface affrighting pains and a life of bitterness respect of men paternal tenderness easy conscience pride of a pure soul fortune honour hope love all these are gone there is no longer any question of loving and living there are tears to feed upon and precarious flouted miserable days to drag along there is no longer any question of plunging deeper into illusions into love into life there are dreams to thrust aside there is oblivion to seek there is death to await sincere and loving women adorned with all outward graces and every charm of soul made to be purely tenderly faithfully loved love not letter eighty one august five nine you admit that morality alone should engage the writer who proposes to accomplish a great and useful end but certain views on the nature of life towards which you think that i have hitherto seemed to lean are not in consonance with the investigation of the moral laws and the foundation of duties i should like to avoid self-contradiction and will strive to do so but with the variations of incertitude i cannot reproach my weakness i have examined to no purpose and have brought to such examination impartiality and even severity but i can find no real contradictions there may be some discrepancy between different things which i have said were these to be regarded as positive statements as the several parts of a system or of a body of principles set out as certainties interlinked with and deduced from one another but detached thoughts speculations over things impenetrable may vary without being in contradiction i may confess even that there is this or that conjecture as to the course of nature which at times i find exceedingly possible and at others much less so according to the way in which my imagination approaches the subject i may happen to say necessity rules all things and if the world on this principle be inexplicable on any other it is impossible but having thus interpreted the position it may so happen on the morrow that taking the opposite standpoint i observe on the contrary so many things are ruled according to intelligence that numbers of others must also be governed thereby intelligence may choose among the possibilities in hearing in the necessary essence of things and the nature of such possibilities comprised within a limited sphere is such that although the world can exist only after certain modes each thing is susceptible notwithstanding of many different constructions intelligence is not sovereign over matter but it makes use thereof it cannot create or destroy it it cannot denaturalize or change its laws but it can stimulate adapt combine it it is not an omnipotence it is a vast industry limited by the laws inherent in the essence of beings it is a sublime alchemy which man terms supernatural because it exceeds his conception here you will say are two systems which cannot both be admitted i grant it yet there is no contradiction since i present them as hypotheses only 
i do not maintain or even admit either in any precise way nor do i assume to be acquainted with that which is unknowable by man every general system concerning the nature of existence and the laws of the world is at most a notion that is hazarded a few may give credence to these their dreams or desire that others should do so but it is either from utter charlatanism or overweening obstinacy for myself i can only question and if i say definitely that necessity rules all things or again that a secret force is working to an end which we can at times foresee i employ these positive expressions to save the incessant repetition of it seems to me i suppose i imagine such a way of speaking can neither represent my conviction nor deceive any one for who unless he is demented will affirm what it is impossible to know it is altogether different when forsaking these dark researches we confine ourselves to the only human science namely ethics while the eye of man can discern nothing as to the essence of existences it can see all that concerns the relations of man we find therein a light which is adjusted to our organs there we can discover reason affirm there also we are answerable for our ideas their connection their agreement their truth and it is there that assured principles must be sought as it is there in fine that contradictory consequences would be unpardonable the study of ethics may be open to a single objection but though this offers a serious difficulty it is not one which need detain us on the hypothesis that necessity rules all things what will result from our researches our precepts our virtues that it rules in such a manner is not however proven the opposite sentiment obtains in man and it is enough that in every action of life he considers that he is left to himself in spite of destiny the stoic believed in virtue and those orientals who cling to the dogma of fatalism are like other men in respect of their actions fears and desires did i even regard the universal law of necessity as probable i might still investigate the principles of improved human institutions when crossing a lake on a stormy day i might say to myself if events are unchangeably determined it matters little whether the rowers are drunk or not but as it is possible that it may be otherwise i should rather advise them not to drink till after they get ashore if necessity rules all things it rules also my caution herein and in like manner the fact that i am erroneously terming it caution i have no head for those subtleties by which it is pretended to harmonize free will with foreknowledge choice on the part of man with absolute power in god the infinite detestation which the author of all justice has necessarily for all sin and the inconceivable means which he has employed to prevent or repair it with the persistent empire of injustice and an opportunity for criminal conduct so long as we choose i experience some difficulty in conciliating both the infinite benevolence which by its will created man and the indubitable knowledge of what would come of it with the eternity of hideous torment for forty-nine out of fifty of the creatures who notwithstanding have been loved so well i might discourse indefinitely like others and with skill or learning on these impenetrable questions but if i ever write i shall devote myself rather to that which concerns man socially united in his temporal life since it seems to me that it is only by observing the consequences as to which we have assured indications that i can think of true things or give expression to things useful i may reach a certain point in the knowledge of man but i cannot construe nature i can scarcely conceive of two opposed principles co-eternally making and unmaking of a universe formed so late out of nothing subsisting for a time only and thus cutting the indivisible eternity into three parts i am indisposed to speak seriously about that of which i know nothing the natural man discerns not the things which are of the spirit of god nor on the other hand shall i ever comprehend how man who acknowledges intelligence in himself can pretend that the world does not contain 
intelligence unfortunately i can see no better how a faculty can be a substance i shall be told that thought is not body a physically divisible entity and that death cannot therefore destroy it whence although it has begun it is plain that it cannot end and that as it is not body it is of necessity spirit i confess to my misfortune that this triumphant argument seems to me deficient in the merit of common sense here is one which is more serious since there are religions established from of old part and parcel of our human institutions seeming natural to our weakness and the curb or consolation of many it is good to follow and maintain the religion of the country in which one lives should it be impossible to believe therein silence must at least be preserved on this point when writing for mankind at large who must not be dissuaded from a faith which they love this is your own opinion and here is why i am unable to follow it i have no intention to undermine a religious belief in the valleys of the cevennes or the apennines nor yet in my immediate neighbourhood of marianne or switzerland but when speaking of morality is it possible to say nothing of religions that would be a misplaced affectation which deceiving no one would only embarrass my subject and destroy the coherence which alone could render it useful we must respect it is maintained those opinions on which the hope of so many men reposes and the morality of a still greater number i regard this reserve as wise and requisite in those who treat ethical questions only in an accidental manner or write from a diverse point of view than my own will necessarily be but if in writing about human institutions i should omit all reference to religious systems it would be regarded only as a concession to some dominant party and this would call for condemnation as a weakness in venturing to assume such a function i must before all accept the duties which it involves for my abilities i am unable to answer and these will be less or more inadequate but my intentions depend on myself and if they are not invariably pure and steadfast i am unworthy of so great a vocation in literature i shall have no personal enemy as i shall have none at any time in my private life but when it is a question of proclaiming to man that which i regard as true i must not be afraid of offending sect or party i have no desire to offend any but i have no law to accept from any i shall attack things and not men if men regret it if i become an object of horror to some of them i shall not be surprised but this i would not even foresee if in many kinds of writing it be possible to dispense with the mention of religions this is a choice which is denied me and i regret it on several accounts every unbiased person will acknowledge that such silence is impossible in a project like mine the sole literary work to which i can attach importance in writing upon the dispositions of man and upon the general system of ethics i shall therefore speak of religions and assuredly in so doing i can say only that which i think as this is unavoidable i make no attempt to exclude from our correspondence what chance offers on the subject otherwise and in despite of a certain constraint which would follow from it i should much prefer to withhold what i feel must displease or more correctly must afflict you on your part i would ask you whether if in certain chapters i proceed to investigate religions as accidental institutions and to speak of that which comes as it is said from jerusalem how i can be expected to do so as if i had been born at jerusalem i would ask you what real evil can ensue in places quickened by the european spirit where notions are clear and conceptions disillusioned where we live in the forgetfulness of prestige in the unconcealed study of positive and demonstrated sciences i would disabuse no one whose head is so empty as to say that if there were no hell it would not be worth while to be honest 
by a few such persons my book may of course be read nor i do not flatter myself that no harm whatsoever can result from what i shall undertake with the intention of doing good but possibly i may also reduce the number of those fond souls who believe only in duty through their faith in perdition perhaps i shall ensure the survival of duty when relics and horned demons will have ceased to be in fashion the people at large will unavoidably come sooner or later and in any case before long has elapsed to disdain one of the two ideas which they have been accustomed to accept only together and it is therefore advisable to make it plain to them that the separation of those ideas is quite possible without the neglect of the one entailing the subversion of the other this time as i think is quickly drawing near it will be recognized more universally that we must build no longer on a failing foundation the moral citadel without which we should live in a state of secret warfare and in the midst of a more detestable perfidy than the vengeance and prolonged hatred of savage hordes End of section fifty one Section fifty two of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Piver de Senancour. Translated by Arthur Edward Waite, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two. Ninth year. Letters eighty two eighty three and eighty four letter eighty two imenstrom august six nine whether i shall depart from my snow-swathed mountains whether i shall go forth to behold that smiling country of which you give me so alluring a description where the winter is so clement the spring so sweet where the emerald waters break their billows which are born in america i do not know those which i gaze on now come not from so far away in the clefts of these my rocks where like the melancholy owl i go in search of darkness such immensity would be equally ill-suited to my eyes or thoughts and yet the regret that i am away from you increases daily i do not chide myself on account of it i am rather surprised seeking something to explain it i discover nothing and yet i could do no otherwise i assure you some day i shall repair to you that is settled i long to see you in your home i yearn to bring away from it the secret of being happy when nothing is wanting but ourselves at the same time i will visit the pont du gare and the languedoc canal i will gaze upon the grand chartreuse but it shall be on my way and not as i return you will know the reason i love my retreat i shall love it more as the days go on but to live alone i feel that i have the strength no longer let us turn to other matters in yet a few days all here will be finished for four already i have been sleeping in my own room when i let my windows remain open during the night i can hear distinctly the plash of the fountain as the water falls into its basin it breaks as the breath of the wind moves it against the iron bars designed to support the vessels brought thither to be filled there are perhaps few natural accidents so romantic as the sound of light water falling upon still water when all is at its nocturne and we distinguish alone in some valley's depth a torrent rolling profoundly through dense forest land in the heart of the silence that fountain is under a wide roof as i think i have told you the sound of its fall has less of wildness than it would have in the open air but it is more curious and pleasing sheltered without being enclosed resting on a good bed in the midst of the desert possessing in one's own home the advantages of the savage state the conveniences of luxury are joined to the strength of nature primeval things have been shaped as it would seem by our labour but their laws have not been abrogated and a sway so light knows it would seem no limits of such is all man 
this great roof this covering with which you will observe that i am well satisfied is seven fathoms wide and more than twenty long being in a line with the other buildings it is in fact the most commodious of structures it joins the barn and the house without touching the latter it communicates therewith by a gallery of light construction which can be cut quickly in case of fire coach state coach travelling coach tools firewood carpenter's shop spring it holds all without confusion one can work and wash there also and make whatsoever is required without being distressed by the sun the snow or the mud since i hope no longer to see you here except at some remote period i will disclose to you my entire way of living i will describe my whole domicile and perhaps there will be moments when i shall depict you as sharing it with me and us examining deliberating and rearranging together letter eighty three september twenty four nine i waited with some impatience until you had finished your journeys i have new matters to impart to you m de fonsalbe is here he arrived five weeks ago and has come to stay his wife also has been here though he has spent some years on the sea he is a steady and quiet man he neither gambles nor hunts nor smokes he drinks nothing has never danced and he does not sing at the same time he is not by any means melancholy though i think that he has known much sorrow in the past his countenance unites the pleasing indications of the soul's calm with the traces of profound misfortune his eye which usually expresses only a species of repose and dejection was intended to express everything his head is uncommon in its characteristics and amidst his habitual calm if a great idea or a strong sentiment should arouse him he assumes without premeditation the silent attitude of command i have heard an actor admired for his delivery of the i will it i ordain it of nero but fonsalb would utter them better i speak to you impartially he is not so equable within as without but granting that he has the misfortune or defect of an incapacity for happiness he has too much good sense for discontent he is just the man to work the cure of my own impatience he has taken his stand and what is more than this he has proved to me beyond all contention that i also should take mine he maintains that with a life of independence and health added though with these only a man must be an idiot to be happy and a fool to be miserable you will see readily that in view of this statement i could only affirm that for myself i was neither one nor the other and so i affirmed accordingly now it follows that i must comport myself in the future so as not to have told an untruth i begin nevertheless to find something beyond independent life and health fonsalbe will prove a friend and more a friend in my loneliness i do not say a friend as we understood the term formerly we have both passed the age of heroics now it is a question of passing one's days in peace the great things of life do not incline to me i limit myself you say to an attempt at extracting some good from the little which is vouchsafed me by destiny with such a purpose in view it would be a fine thing to dream of friendship after the fashion of the old days setting aside both the friends pictured in the past and those which are to be met with in the cities let us imagine some middle term what does that amount to you will ask and i answer too much there is yet another thought in my mind fonsalb has a son and daughter but before going further let me pause until my project is definitely resolved moreover it implies many details which are still unknown to you and as to which i must instruct you i have fonsalb's permission already to tell you all that concerns him in no sense regarding you as a third person but on the one condition that you will burn the letters letter eighty four st maurice october seven nine 
quite recently an american friend of fonsalbe paid us a flying visit on his way into italy and fonsalbe accompanied him on his journey as far as st branchier at the foot of the mountains i also was of the party and had reckoned on leaving them at st maurice but i went on as far as the cascade of Pise sauvage situated between that town and martigny and a sight of which i had obtained previously from the road alone there i awaited the return of the coach the weather was pleasant the air was calm and extremely mild and just in my clothes as i stood i indulged in a cold vapour bath there is a considerable volume of water having a fall of nearly three hundred feet i went up to it as close as seemed possible and was just as much drenched in a moment as if i had plunged therein i succeeded in regaining some vestige of old impressions when seated thus amidst vapour flung towards the clouds and not less wrapped about by the raging sound of the water which issues from a silent iceberg flowing from a source which is itself motionless to be lost amidst incessant tumult crashing downwards to hollow the abyss and seeming to fall eternally thus do our years descend and thus the ages of mankind brought forth by some secret necessity the days escape from the silence and slip past into the oblivion the course of their hurried phantoms flows onward with monotonous sound and is dissipated amidst incessant repetition there remains only a smoke which works backward even as it rises and of which the shadows that have passed already envelop that inexplicable and purposeless chain the permanent witness of an unknown force the bizarre and mysterious expression of the energy of the world i must confess to you that imenstrom with all my reminiscences my habits my youthful projects my trees my study everything that could distract my affection seemed altogether small at this moment and even abject in my eyes that urgent penetrating water filled as it were with motion that solemn detonation of a falling torrent that cloud springing ever into the air that situation of mind and body dispelled the oblivion wherein years of laborious efforts had perhaps succeeded in plunging me isolated from every locality by this atmosphere of water and by this vast reverberation i beheld all places before me and myself outside of all motionless i was moved notwithstanding by an extraordinary impulsion safe amidst impending ruins i was engulfed as it were by the water and alive in the midst of the abyss i had bidden farewell to earth and pronounced judgment on my ridiculous life not without a feeling of pity but a waking dream replaced the frivolous days by days redeemed more clearly than ever be for i beheld those happy and far back leaves of the scroll of time moses and lycurgus indirectly demonstrated their possibility to the world while their future existence was proved to me in the alps when the men of those days gone by in which it was not preposterous to be a man withdrew into deep solitude within the caverns of the mountains it was not merely to meditate on institutions which they were then projecting thought is not less possible at home and if silence be essential this also can be found in the city nor was it simply to impose upon the public some elementary miracle of magic could have been performed more easily and would have had no less influence on imagination but the soul which is least in subjection does not wholly escape from the tyranny of habit from that conclusion which for the crowd is so persuasive and so specious for genius itself from that doctrine of routine which out of the commonest condition of man educes a natural evidence and demonstration of his destiny separation from human things is indispensable not in order to see that they are susceptible of change but to have the courage to believe it such isolation is not necessary to devise the means which should be employed but to hope for their success go into retreat and in retreat you will see 
the habit of the old order is weakened the extraordinary is judged without bias and is a matter of romance no longer there is faith and on coming forth success before fonsalbe was due to return i made my way to the road drenched even to the skin he maintained that he could reach the actual situation of the waterfall without any such inconvenience i waited to see at first it seemed that he would succeed but the waterspout was exceedingly fluctuating though there was no wind at all in the valley as we were about to retire he was drenched in a single second after which he permitted himself to be led and i took him to the same spot where i had myself been seated but i was afraid that the sudden variations of atmospheric pressure might affect his chest which is not so strong as my own and we retired almost immediately so far i had striven in vain to make him understand me otherwise than by signs but when we were some few yards away and before he was well out of his astonishment i asked him in a situation like this what became of the habits of a man even of his most powerful affections and of the passions which he believes to be unconquerable we walked to and fro between the torrent and the roadway agreeing that a person of the strongest organization might have no positive passion despite his aptitude for all and that there have been actually many such among mankind not only among rulers of nations but magi gymnosophists and the true and faithful believers of various religions whether islamism christianity or buddhism the superior man has all the faculties of man and can experience all human affections but he pauses only at the grandest which his destiny affords him whosoever tolerates the subservience of great thoughts to small or selfish ideas whosoever amidst things important either for his activity or his decision is moved by mean affections and sordid interest is not a superior man the latter never fails to see further than himself or his performances instead of being behind his destiny he advances invariably beyond its assigned limits and this native impulsion of his soul is in no sense the greed of power or of dignities he is above dignities and power he loves all that is useful noble and just all that is beautiful he loves he accepts power because he needs it to restore the beautiful and the useful but he would by choice lead a simple life because this can be pure and good at times he accomplishes what can be performed by human passions but one thing to him is impossible and that is to accomplish it by passion the true statesman as well as the superior man is never passionately enamoured of women never loves gambling or wine but i claim in addition to all this that he is never ambitious when he acts like those who are born to gaze upon him with astonishment he is not influenced by the motives which are familiar to them he is neither suspicious nor confident neither dissimulating nor frank neither grateful nor without gratitude he is nothing of the kind his heart waits his intelligence leads so long as he is at his place he proceeds towards his end which is order in its general sense and the improvement of the condition of men of whomsoever we can say that he knows this weakness or has that tendency the same is a man like other men but the man who is born to govern is just and absolute when undeceived he becomes even more he is no longer absolute no longer master he is a sage end of section fifty two section fifty three of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m pivert de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two ninth year letters eighty five and eighty six letter eighty five Immenstrom october twelve nine 
i must confess to the same fear it was natural to conclude that the kind of indolence into which i have been plunged by my weariness would soon become almost an invincible habit but on further reflection i felt that there was no real need for anxiety that the evil was already within me and that in circumstances similar to the present i should by my nature be just what i am yet it also seemed to me that in another situation i should be a different character altogether the way that i vegetate in the order of things that now surrounds me would have no effect on my conduct did the time come for me to prescribe myself as much activity as there is little at present required of me what would be the use of attempting an erect posture at the hour for repose why go on living in the tomb because a man is diligent and disinclined to squander his day should he for that reason refuse to sleep at night my night i admit is too long but is it my fault if days are short and nights are dark in my natal season like any one else i would be abroad when the summer is here but awaiting that i sleep by the fireside during the frost Fonsalbe is i think becoming somnolescent like myself there is an incongruity altogether in keeping with the misery of man in our sad and tranquil habits amidst the most beautiful retreat of a country which is so beautiful and in the ease of our life amidst a few unfortunates who at the same time are more contented than we shall ever be i must give you some account of our absurdities you will find that for the most part there is no touch of bitterness in our languor it is needless to tell you that i do not keep a large retinue in the country and with our way of living there is plenty of occupation for the servants and the bells may be pulled ten times before any one will appear what i have sought is convenience and not display i have also to avoid unnecessary expenses and i am quite as willing to fatigue myself by pouring out water from a decanter into a glass as to ring till an able-bodied lackey is brought from the far end of the house to perform the office as for fonsalbe and myself we scarcely move independently of one another and a bell communicates from his sleeping apartment to my own and also to my study the mode of ringing it varies and in this way we warn one another not in accordance with what we want but in accordance with our fancies so that the bell is sounding very frequently the more burlesque these fancies are the more they amuse us they are the playthings of our idleness we are princes to this extent and without having states to govern we pursue our somewhat farcical caprices we always regard it as an advantage to have something to laugh at but with this proviso that our laughter causes no one mortification some perfect puerility brings us to a pause sometimes while computing the worlds with lambert sometimes also imbued with the enthusiasm of pindar we amuse ourselves with the imposing strut of a guinea-fowl or the combative feats of two lovesick cats disputing for their inamorata for some time past we have come to this agreement that whichever one of us goes for half an hour without being able to sleep shall wake up the other so that he also may have his chance of exercising patience similarly he who has an amusing dream or one calculated to produce a strong emotion must immediately warn the other so that when taking our tea next morning it may be explained according to the occult science of the elder world i can now toy a little with sleep which i have begun to recover since i have given up coffee and either take tea very moderately or substitute buttermilk or simple water i used to sleep so to speak without being aware of it and without repose as without enjoyment both in sleeping and in waking i was absolutely the same as at midday but now i obtain for a few minutes that sensation of the gradual approach of slumber that voluptuous drowsiness which precedes complete oblivion of life and the daily return of which renders life tolerable to the unfortunate by its continuous suspension and division at such times it is well to be in bed even if one does not actually sleep 
towards morning i turn over and though i am neither asleep nor awake i experience a sense of comfort and dream at such times peacefully furthermore in these calm moments i find pleasure in contemplating life which seems quite foreign to me as if i had no part therein what strikes me at such times above all is the babble of its ways and means and the nothingness of its results this vast toil of all beings either with one end that is uncertain sterile perhaps even contradictory or with many ends that are opposed and vain the moss flourishes on the rock which is battered by the waves but its flower will perish the violet blooms to no purpose under the shrub in the wilderness thus does man desire and thus will he die he is born by an accident he makes attempts with no end in view he battles without object he feels and thinks in vain he passes without having lived while he even who has contrived to achieve life will pass in like manner caesar won fifty battles and conquered the western world but he has gone and mahomet and pythagoras preceded him the cedar which overshadowed the flock has passed like the grass which the flocks have trampled the more we strive to see the more we plunge into the night all things work for their conservation and reproduction the end of their actions is apparent why is that of their being concealed the animal has organs powers industry to ensure his subsistence as well as the perpetuation of his species he works to live and he lives to reproduce his kind and he reproduces it but why live why perpetuate the species i understand nothing of all this the beast browses and dies the man eats and dies one morning i reflected upon everything that man does ere death overtakes him and i was so impelled to laughter that i pulled the bell twice at the breakfast hour however we never feel able to laugh and on this particular day fonsau pretended to discover a great deal that was serious in the things of art and of glory in the transcendent sciences the metaphysics of the trinities and i know not what else after this breakfast i laid the spirit of things on my table and read almost the whole of one volume i must admit to you that this system of the reparation of the world in no way repels me it is not modern but that can only increase its authority it is grand it is specious the author has entered into the depth and i take kindly to the excessive obscurity of his terms for they make one the less struck with the obscurity of the things themselves i am quite willing to believe that the hypothesis of a fortuitous degradation and a slow regeneration of a force which vivifies exalts and subtilizes and of another which corrupts and degrades is not the least plausible of our dreams about the nature of things i would ask only how comes this great revolution or how at least it should have come about why the whole world thus escaped from the hands of the eternal how it was that the eternal permitted it or why he was unable to prevent it and what power alien to the universal power has produced the universal catastrophe this system explains everything except the initial difficulty but the oriental doctrine of two contending principles was clearer whatever may be the answer to a question which doubtless is little intended for the dwellers on earth i know nothing which accounts for the perpetual phenomenon all the accidents of which overwhelm our intelligence and disconcert our curious eagerness we see individuals combined together and multiply that they may advance with a growing and continuous force towards i know not what end from which they are continually driven back a celestial industry unceasingly produces by an infinity of means while a principle of inertia a dead force resists coldly and extinguishes and destroys wholesale the particular agents are all passive but tend notwithstanding zealously towards that which they cannot conceive and the end of this general tendency unknown as it is to them would seem also unknown to all that exists 
not only does the system of beings seem full of contrast in the means and of opposition in the products but the power which moves it seems vague restless enervated or counterbalanced by an indefinable force nature appears checked in her progress and as if embarrassed and uncertain we believe ourselves to perceive some gleam of light in the abyss if we regard the worlds as spheres of activity as schools of regeneration where matter gradually elaborated and subtilized by a principle of life is destined to pass from the brute or passive condition to that point of exaltation and tenuity which shall at last make it fit to be impregnated with fire and pervaded with light it will then be employed by intelligence no longer as formless materials but as a perfected instrument then like a direct agent and finally as an essential part of the one being who will then become truly universal and truly one the ox is strong and powerful but he does not know it he absorbs a vast multitude of vegetation he devours a meadow what important advantage does he derive from it he ruminates he vegetates sluggishly in the stable where he is immured by a man heavy melancholy useless as himself the man will slay the ox will eat it and will not be better off and after the ox is dead the man himself will die what then will remain of both a handful of fertilizing matter which will produce new grass to nourish other flesh what a vain and uneloquent alternation of life and death how cold and universe where can be the advantage of existing rather than existing not but if this silent and terrible fermentation which seems to beget only to immolate to make only to unmake to bring forth germs only to squander them or to impart the consciousness of life only to inflict the quivering of the death struggle if this force which moves eternal matter amidst the darkness casts also some gleams to show forth the light if this power which offers battle to inertia and gives promise of existence pulverizes the work of its hands to prepare it for some grand design if this world wherein we appear is only the first sketch of a world if that which is foretells only that which shall be then the astonishment which visible evil excites in us may perhaps seem to be explained the present toils for the future and the order of the world is that the actual world shall be consumed this great sacrifice was necessary and is great in our eyes alone we pass away in the hour of disaster but it is unavoidable and the history of all that exists to-day is summed up in the one word that they have lived a fruitful and invariable order will be the product of the agonizing crisis which destroys ourselves the work is already begun and the ages of life will subsist when we our complaints our hopes and our systems will have passed away for ever such was the feeling of the ancients who preserved the belief in the distress under which the whole earth labours this vast and profound idea produced the institutions of the earlier ages which endure in the memory of the nations as a great monument of sublime sadness but tribes which remained barbarous and hordes collected by fugitives who had forgotten the antique traditions during their forest wanderings the pelasgi the scythians the scandinavians spread gothic doctrines fictions of verse-makers and the false magic of the savages subsequently the history of things has become their enigma till the day when a man cut off only to early set himself to rend some part of the veil which had been spread by the barbarians so runs my reverie but at length some movement distracts me my attitude changes and the train of thought passes away at other times i find myself in an indefinable situation i neither sleep nor wake and there is something pleasant in this dubious condition i am prone to the mingling and confusing of the ideas of the day with those of slumber frequently i preserve something of the soft agitation which is left by a vivid terrible or singular dream filled with those mysterious correspondences and that picturesque incoherence which entertain imagination 
the genius of man awake falls short of that which the caprices of night-time present to him a short time ago i beheld a volcano in eruption but never was the terror of a volcano so grand so affrighting so beautiful i looked on from some high situation it was i think the window of a palace and there were many persons about me it was night but the night was illuminated the moon and saturn shone in the sky between scattered clouds driven rapidly all things else were calm saturn seemed nearer to the earth and larger than the moon while his ring white as molten metal lighted up the vast cultivated and crowded plain far off but clearly distinguishable a long chain of snowy mountains high uplifted and uniform seemed to join plain and sky i looked closer a terrific wind blew over the country and swept away all signs of cultivation of dwellings of forests leaving in a moment nothing but a desert of burning sand red and enkindled as it were by some interior fire then the ring of saturn dropped from the planet slid through the heavens and ascending with ominous swiftness touched the high snowy peaks which shaking to their base rose up and quivered to and fro like enormous waves of a sea moved by the quaking of the entire globe yet a few moments and flames burst forth from the summits of these white billows leaping towards heaven then falling back and flowing in burning tides the mountains were pallid or enkindled according as they rose or sank down in their mournful movement and all this great disaster was accomplished in the midst of a silence more mournful still most likely you will think that amidst this ruin of a world i woke up full of horror before the catastrophe occurred but my dream did not finish in accordance with the rules as a matter of fact it went on while the flames burnt themselves out and a great calm followed then darkness supervened we closed the windows of the palace fell to talking in the saloon on the subject of fireworks and my dream continued i have heard it said more than once that our dreams depend on things which have impressed us during the course of the day preceding i fully admit that in common with our ideas and sensations they are composed only of things that are already familiar of which we have already had experience but i think that the mode of their composition has frequently no other relationship with the past all that we can imagine is fabricated only from that which is but we dream as we imagine new things and things which frequently have no discernible connection with what we have seen previously some dreams return constantly in the same manner identical to their smallest details without our having thought of them during the intervals between their recurrence i have seen in sleep more beautiful scenes than any which i have ever imagined and i have always seen them the same from my infancy upwards i have found myself during sleep in the vicinity of one of the chief towns of europe the aspect of the place differed essentially from that of the country really surrounding the capital which i have never seen and every time i have dreamed that i was travelling towards this town i have found the scene such as i first dreamed it and not such as it is again some twelve or fifteen times i have dreamed of a place in switzerland which i knew prior to my dreaming but whenever i visit it in sleep it differs altogether from reality yet is always the same as i saw it for the first time in that condition some weeks ago i beheld a delightful valley so perfectly in accordance with my tastes that i doubt if such a place can exist last night i visited it again and there met an old man quite alone who was eating mouldy bread at the door of a miserable little hut i have been waiting for you he said and knew that you were certain to come in a few days i shall be no more and you will find change here subsequently we embarked on the lake in a small boat which he caused to turn round and round casting himself at last into the water i also sank to the bottom was drowned and woke up von saub pretends that a dream like this must be prophetic and that i shall really see the identical lake and valley in order that the dream may be accomplished we have made up our minds that should we come across such a place i shall go on the water provided that the boat is properly constructed the lake calm and no old man to be seen letter eighty six imenstrom november sixteen nine 
your shrewdness has not failed to perceive what for my own part i have scarcely so much as hinted you conclude thence that i consider myself destined for a celibate and i must confess that he who anticipates that destiny is very near to incurring it seeing that the impulsion of life is lost when stripped of its most ingenuous falsities i think with you that more may be spent than gained by standing too much on the defensive by avoiding that hazardous bond which promises so many delights and occasions so much of bitterness domestic life without it is void and cold above all for the sedentary man happy is he who is neither condemned to live solitary nor to regret that he is not alone i find nothing that can be honestly denied or disputed in your observations regarding marriage that to which i should take exception is that precisely to which you make no reference i hold it as proven that men ought to marry yet that which is duty under one aspect may become madness folly or crime under another it is not so easy to conciliate the several principles which rule our conduct the celibate in general is justly recognized as an evil but that any given individual can be blamed for adopting this state is altogether another question it is true that to say this is equivalent to defending myself and that anything which i advance tends to excuse me in my own eyes but can it signify that the cause is mine so long as it is good in its favour i have only to make a single observation and it seems to me one the justice of which is evident i am fortunate in making it to you who on a certain memorable evening would have openly contested with me the necessity of a reformation designed to bring unity harmony and simplicity within the range of our duties to you who charge me with exaggeration when i argue that it was more difficult and less common to have sufficient discernment to recognize duty than to find adequate strength for following it you had on your side a formidable array of authorities ancient and modern on mine there were equally great and on this point the best of intentions may well have betrayed a solon a cicero and even others our moral code is presumed to be complete and there remains therefore nothing to say to mankind except to direct them to obey it take their good faith for granted and it must follow that they will be always just but for myself i am so unfortunate as to think that such a code still remains to be made i am one among those who discern contradictions therein the prolific sources of incertitude and i sympathize with those upright persons who are more embarrassed in the choice than weak as regards its execution i have met with cases over which i defy any man however uninfluenced by personal considerations to pronounce without hesitation and about which the most skilled moralist will never decide as quickly as may often be necessary to act but among all these difficult cases i will lay stress only on one it is that over which i must clear myself and i therefore return to it the happiness of a woman must be guaranteed and that of her children prepared and hence all must be arranged so that there may be certitude or at least a strong probability on this point we owe it also to ourselves and to the rest of our future duties to make sure of our ability to fulfil them and consequently the likelihood of being in a position which permits such fulfilment or at least offers us the modicum of happiness necessary to the utilization of life it is both an error and an imprudence to choose a woman who will fill our days with disorder disgust or opprobrium one who must be cast off or abandoned or one with whom all mutual felicity will be impossible it is a mistake to give birth to beings for whom we can probably do nothing we must be reasonably assured if not of our ability to leave them in an independent position that we can at least equip them with the moral advantages of education and the opportunity of being something of fulfilling in society a position neither sordid nor dishonest in the course of a journey it is difficult to choose our lodging for the night in advance and we therefore make shift with any inn that we meet with but at least you take care in selecting your more permanent abode and would hesitate to fix yourself for life 
or purchase an estate without ascertaining whether you are likely to be suited for all the more reason you will not make a choice at hazard which is of much higher importance not in itself alone but because it is irrevocable an absolute or chimerical perfection must not of course be aspired to we must not seek in another for that which we dare not pretend to offer them ourselves and pass judgment on that which offers itself with so much severity as to preclude us from attaining what we seek but shall we approve for all that of the impatient man who casts himself into the first comer's arms and in three months will be compelled to break with the companion thus inconsiderately chosen or to debar himself through all his life from a true union so as to perpetuate one that is false these difficulties in marriage are not the same for all they are special in a sense to a certain class of men and in that class are frequent and great we are answerable for the destiny of another are subject to a multitude of considerations and it may so chance that circumstances permit no reasonable choice up to the age when none can be expected end of section fifty three section fifty four of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two ninth year letter eighty seven november twenty nine how great is the confusion of life and how difficult is the art of self-conduct therein what disappointments follow on well-doing what disorders after sacrificing all to order what troubles through seeking to regulate everything when our destiny refused all law you will scarcely imagine what i am introducing by this preamble but engrossed by fonsalbe full of the idea of his weariness of all that has happened to him and all that must yet befall him of all which i know or that he has told me i feel in the presence of an abyss of injustice aversion remorse and more deplorable in this sequence of miseries i see nothing which in itself is surprising and nothing that is peculiar to him were it possible to know all secrets to penetrate the concealed places of the heart and perceive the bitterness which fills it our contented men our pleasant homes our cheerful circles would be nothing but a multitude of unfortunates striving with the chain which binds them and swallowing the troubled lees of that cup of suffering to which they can see no bottom all their sufferings they veil all their false joys they magnify striving to display them before jealous eyes for ever vigilant of others they take up a position of vantage so that the tears which fill their eyes may impart to them an apparent glitter to be envied at a distance as if they were the expression of pleasure the pretence of happiness fills the first place among social vanities each man feigns to sympathize with all but poses in such a way as to invite felicitations from all should he speak of his troubles to a confidant his eye his lip his demeanour all indicate suffering and despite the force of his character deep sighs accuse his lamentable destiny while his behaviour is that of a man whose only resource is death yet immediately a stranger enters you observe that his head is thrown up his brow lightens his eye is steady he creates the impression of a man who is not to be subdued by adversities of one who sports with fate and can pay the price of his pleasures there is nothing even to his necktie that is not arranged in a smarter manner he moves like a man who under the emotion of felicity defers to the greater findings of his destiny this vain parade this passion for seemly exteriors is unknown only to fools and almost everybody is the dupe of it notwithstanding the entertainment from which you are absent appears enjoyable though that which you are actually attending is only an additional burden 
you speak of another as possessing a hundred advantages and if you are told that your own equal or exceed them you reply that it may seem so but o oh, deluded man has he not also these buts each of these fortunate persons appears with his company face even as the common people come out in their sunday clothes in garret and closet the wretchedness remains behind all the same joy or at least patience may be seen on the lip discouragement sufferings the frenzy of passion and weariness are in the depth of the lacerated heart the exterior of all this vast concourse is artifice it may be brilliant it is at least supportable but it is frightful within it is on such conditions that we have earned the possibility of hope unless we thought that others were better placed than ourselves and that hence an improvement is possible in our own condition which of us would drag on to the end of his imbecile days actuated by a project which was well planned and promising if a little romantic von saub set out for spanish america he was delayed at martinique by an incident of a bizarre kind which though it promised to be short had nevertheless prolonged consequences compelled at length to abandon his previous designs he decided on the return voyage and only waited opportunity a distant relative with whom he was staying in the antilles fell ill and died at the end of a few days on his deathbed he gave von saub to understand that his last consolation would be to bequeath him his daughter whose happiness he believed would be assured in this manner von saub who had given her no thought objected that as they had lived for six months in the same house without having formed any special intimacy he had no doubt that he was and must remain indifferent in her eyes the father persisting assured him that his daughter was disposed to love him and had confessed it when refusing to contract another marriage von saub though he protested no longer still hesitated in his own mind for his defeated projects he substituted that of filling amiably and honourably the duties of an obscure life ensuring the happiness of a woman and begetting children early in order to form their character he imagined that the defects of the lady designed for him were those of education only and that her good qualities were natural so he decided and passed his word the father died as i have said some months elapsed the son and daughter arranged to divide the property which was left to them a war was being waged in the islands and the ships of the enemy were cruising in the vicinity an attack was expected and under this pretext the future brother-in-law of von saub arranged everything for a sudden departure when necessary to a place of security but during the night he repaired to the fleet with all the negroes of the plantation carrying everything portable with him it was ascertained afterwards that he had settled in an island belonging to the english where he had fallen upon evil days thus despoiled his sister seemed fearful that von saub might abandon her in spite of his promise thereupon he precipitated the marriage for which he had been waiting the consent of his family but such a suspicion to which he condescended to make no answer was ill calculated to increase his esteem for a woman whom he thus took to himself without any opinion good or bad concerning her or any other sentiment than an ordinary friendship it is quite possible for a union without love to be a happy one but their characters were in little agreement they had however something in common and it is in such a case that love would i think avail to bring them wholly into unison reason would have been possibly a sufficient impulse but its full action is only in the heart of order and their condition was opposed to a consistent and regulated life we live once only and naturally we cling to our system when it is at the same time that of reason and of the heart we feel warranted in venturing on the good which will never be accomplished if we wait for certainties whether you will look at it from my point of view i do not know but von saub i think did well he has been punished for it but this was of necessity 
but was he therefore in the wrong if we have only once to live ah real duty sole consolation of a fleeting existence sacred morality wisdom of the heart of man he has broken none of your laws he has put away some few transitory notions he has ignored our petty conventions the custom of a corner of the world the legislation of a suburb would condemn him but those men of antiquity whom we have revered for three thousand years those just and great men they assuredly would have acted and did act as he has the more i know of fonsalbe the more i see that we are destined to remain together we have decided to do so and the nature of things settled it before ourselves i am glad that he has no profession here he will fill your place so far as it is possible for a new friend to succeed one of twenty years standing so far as i can find in my present condition one shadow of our ancient dreams the intimacy between fond saub and myself outstrips the progress of time and has already the venerable character of antiquity his confidence is boundless and as he is naturally very prudent and reserved you may think how i value it i owe him a great deal my life is something less useless and it bids fair to become peaceful despite this interior weight which he can at times cause me to forget though he cannot remove it he has restored to my deserts something of their enchanting beauty and of the romance of their alpine scenes an unfortunate a friend finds some sweet hours among them which before he did not know we take our walks in company we discourse we roam at random and we are well off when together day by day i see plainer what hearts by a contrary destiny may be concealed among men who do not know them and in an order of things where they were each in search of one another fonsalbe has lived sadly amidst perpetual disquietude and enjoyed nothing he is two or three years my senior and he feels that life is slipping by i have told him the past is stranger to us than the existence of some unknown being nothing of reality remains to it the memories which it leaves are too empty to be counted as good or evil by a wise man what ground can there be for complaints or regrets about that which is no more had you once been the happiest of men would the present time be better on that account had you suffered the most dreadful evils he did not interrupt me but i paused of my own accord i felt that if he had lived for ten years in a damp cellar it must have permanently affected his health that moral sufferings leave also ineffaceable impressions and that when a man of sense deplores the misfortunes which he has apparently ceased to experience it is in reality their manifold consequences which he is bewailing when the opportunity of a good action has been voluntarily allowed to escape it is not usually met with a second time and those whose nature is to do good are thus visited for their negligence when the considerations of the moment or the interests of their passions prevent them with this natural disposition some of us combine a rational determination to follow it and the habit of silencing every opposing appetite their sole intention their prime desire is in every respect to fill well the part of man and to do what they judge to be good can they witness without regret the withdrawal of every possibility of laudably accomplishing things which belonging only to private life are yet important because so few men have any thought of performing them well it is no small part of life however narrow and secondary it may be considered to fulfil in respect of one's wife not only what is prescribed by duty but all that is counselled or permitted by an enlightened reason great public functions are occupied honourably by many persons who would be incapable of acting in private as fonsalbe would have done if his wife had been just in mind and stable in character so qualified in a word as to follow his trend of thought the pleasures of confidence and familiarity are very great among friends 
but when vitalized and increased by all those details which the sense of the distinction of sex occasions such delicate pleasures are unlimited is there a more delightful domestic condition than that of being good and just in the eyes of a beloved woman doing all things for her and exacting nothing in return expecting only what is natural and upright on her part but pretending to nothing that is exclusive rendering her worthy of all esteem and yet leaving her to her own initiative sustaining counselling and protecting but not ruling and not enslaving making her a friend who not only conceals nothing but has nothing to conceal without forbidding her things which become therefore indifferent but which others would and ought to silence and to interdict making her more perfect and at the same time more untrammelled than she could otherwise be possessing all rights over her in order to confer upon her all freedom that an upright soul can accept and compassing thus at least in the obscurity of our life the felicity of a human being who is fitted to receive happiness without corrupting it and liberty of mind without being thereby corrupted End of section 54